That's my second presentation today. So, what the heck we I'm Stephen Harrington, and I'm a senior in the MET program, as all the presenters today will be. Um, I did a pivoting solar panel mount. And I decided to do this actually late in the fall quarter. I originally was going to be doing a mount for the Model P transmission that's sitting over there, the nice red green thing, which was one of my favorite labs that we did in uh, machine design. I thought that was a really, really fun thing, the way the planetary gears work. But after talking with Roger, kind of decided that there's really not a big problem there to be solved engineering-wise. It's something that needs to be done to make the lab work better, but it's not a big problem. So I happened to be on a field trip the day before we came to that conclusion, and I was talking to Gary Neistat, the head of the Ellensburg Solar Project, and I was talking to him about the fact that their, the panels can't pivot, so what angle he has them set at for when they're, they're getting sun, and you know, in the winter time they'll lose efficiency because they're angled a little bit higher, in the peak of the summer they'll lose efficiency because they're angled too low, and I was talking to him and he said he'd love to be able to pivot those panels, but it's just not cost effective. So I decided then that, that I think that would be a cool project to look at. And that's when I started looking it up. And so in the winter in Ellensburg, this, this is for 40 degrees latitude, but Ellensburg is about 46. So it's a little bit different than this, but pretty close. But in the winter, you get, obviously the sun's a lot lower in the sky, and the summer is a lot higher in the sky. Uh, I have the exact numbers farther on. Um, the peak is about um, 68 degrees, and the Ellensburg solar part is set at just about 45, a little bit warmer. And so I decided that I should look at that, and I started designing for that. And the design process started off pretty shaky, uh, mostly conferring with my dad and my brothers. And we had things all the way from Hydraulic jacks, uh, electric motors, run like you know, take the craftsman battery, plug it in, go change it when you want to. Hand cranks, walk out, pump something, all kinds of ideas. And I decided, you know, I'm designing this for a, a home use setting to test it out. Simpler is better. You don't need all kinds of mechanisms to do one simple thing. So when I came to an actual design, it was. Just something simple like this with a pin mark on it. But then after running some of the numbers, I decided that it'd be a little bit better to add an arm down down low so there's less of moment acting on the pin if it was locking up here. So you have it locked down lower, you don't have you get more strength with less material basically. And so I came to the final final ish design. I had I had the basics of what I wanted, but then I, I had iterations where there's only one arm down below. Um, originally, when I designed it, this triangle piece was 15 inches. Yeah. Things changed all the way throughout after looking at things, doing the calculations, looking at material costs, you know, all, all the things that have factors in building something. So once I finally came to a decision of how I wanted to build it, I went out in the fabrication process. And this says four and a half days, it should have been five and a half, because I totally, when I was making this up, I forgot about how much trouble it was just to find the material I needed. I spent all of two or three days trying to find just the one tubing piece that I needed because I was on the west side on a weekend, and drove to about eight different places, three of them were closed, three of them had just gotten rid of what I needed, Big hassle. I ended up buying it for fifteen dollars at the out of a Snohomish Iron Work, which is basically a guy with a cool building with functional equipment and awesome strap pile. So it worked out great. And then then I went into actually manufacturing it. And I started by patterning all my cuts and getting ready to do it. You know, measure measure twice, cut once, and then sometimes it's still cut twice. I uh, originally did it with a chop saw, and the cuts just weren't coming up clean. 
And I, I decided to do it with the chop saw because I could do angle cuts with it. It had it had an angle guide so you could pre-cut or preset it and just move it down nice and smooth. And it worked okay, but it left it not so straight, really burned. So I made all the straight cuts just with a, a band saw, and that worked out really well. And then I ended up doing all the angle cuts just with a, a hand zip create saw. And it actually worked out really well. I just made up a jig so I could put the saw against it and slide it down. I made my cuts straight. So then I was able to lay everything out, get it ready to weld and grind it down. And I got to thank my brother. He did all the welding for me. And, and then after welding it up and painting it, I was ready to assemble. And this is a, uh, this video of Garrett helping me make. It's just a mock assembly of re-putting on the head and it'll show you how the, the axle actually works. So this is just showing how this, the head piece is actually just a tube welded on top of the, the, the monofold design, the mount, and then another, a smaller tube, just slightly smaller diameter, slides inside, and then the two angle pivots <coughs> slide over that. And then the mount head comes down on top, and when it's bolted together, is what actually holds the axle and everything together. So instead of having extra extra pieces to hold it together down at the base or to you know, be able to have the head and the axle on there without having the, the mount. It's, it's all held together just by the one piece. So when it's together, it works great, but it's kind of difficult to get together. But it went together pretty quick. Fulfilled the, the minute video by putting it together. But it didn't go quite over. And then once it's assembled, you have the finished color panel now. And that's the way the process of assembling it, actually I was very happy with uh, my scheduling. Because when I actually went to work on it, aside from a few cutting errors and finding material, I was well within my my budgeted time for the manufacturing. That was, again, thanks to Roger and Professor Pringle because they said, take what you think you're gonna do and multiply by three. So I was just about right on with that. And then I also have to thank Roger because he lent me some material to do my testing. And to do my testing, I started with the adjustability and ergonomics. Just can it be easily adjusted? Does it is it comfortable to adjust, or is, you know, are you got five people pushing on different things? So in my design requirements, I, st I stated that it needed to be easily adjusted by no more than two people. I was able to get it done with one person, and in my success criteria, I stated on a scale from one to ten, um, I had people, a bunch, I had ten people try it and had had them rate on a scale of one to 10, how easy they thought it was, how comfortable it was to use. And I stated my success success criteria needed a 60% on each one of those to pass. And it ended up getting that just barely on the ergonomics. And my biggest complaint was the pin to hold it in. It doesn't line up perfect, so it's kind of good to jiggle it, push it in there. But I figure if you're adjusting it four times a year, that's not too bad. Um, my mom really didn't like it. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's 60 years old, five feet tall, and has really bad arthritis. So she kind of just gave up when she was trying to get it in. But she got it pinned enough that it didn't move anymore. Um, nobody else really had any big problems. <coughs> Again, the biggest complaint was just it didn't slide in easily. And then the efficiency testing, this is the, the testing that I was most interested in. This is a lot of numbers, but over here on the left it shows uh, solar mass, the sun will get up to 67 degrees in the sky. At the min, minimum, it'll be down to 20 degrees from the horizon in the sky. So to do my testing, 
I only I could only do it in the springtime. Or, yeah, in springtime when I had my project built, I knew what I was doing. So all my numbers are based off of um, 54 degrees, I believe. Yeah, 54 degrees is where the sun was at when I did my testing. So to to be able to test the other angles with that, I I worked out the offset angles. So how far from the current angle will I have to adjust it to equal what the angle will be? So this one more clearly demonstrates that that idea, and this is just the current what it was on the day I did my testing. If your panel was mounted at the solar minimum, you are missing 18% of the solar radiation that is coming down at that time. If your panel was mounted at the solar maximum, you're missing 3%. Solar medium, you're missing 2%. It just so happened that from my from the day I did my testing, the solar solar max was almost exactly as far away from the the current angle as the solar median. So I didn't get really good contrast numbers with that one, but I did I did meet um, with each one of these the actual power output almost directly matches what the geometry of how much surface area is visible as far as perpendicular from the, the sun would dictate. So I was really happy with that. So it it proved my principle that you got more surface area exposed to the sun, you will have better power output. For my wind load testing, uh, I stated that I wanted it to be able to withstand 30 miles sustained or 60 mile an hour gust. And I worked out my numbers for a four by four foot square panel. And uh, after working that out, I decided I it's kind of over-engineered, it's a lot of steel for that big of a panel, so I wanted to be able to hold more. So I tested it up to 300 pounds. So using uh, the car lift my dad had and a, a crane scale I was able to borrow from my brother's company, I hung the scale from the, the front and the back end individually and then hooked the bar across, of it, across it and hooked it underneath the rails of the lift and dropped it down on to simulate weight on each spot. And I was able to get numbers really good for that and it, it's still standing so it passed. That that was I wasn't too excited to do it because I I had very bad images in my head if it did fail. But it worked. Um, my budget I was pretty happy with it because I was paying all out of pocket. And I was able to either acquire or already had lots of material I needed to use. So I was able to stay under budget. But what this kind of demonstrated for me is, for me, building at home, it was cost effective for the, the increases in power output I would get. But if I would have had to pay the full price, and this is just for material, if I would have had to pay the full price and manufacturing costs for welders and hours work, and it would not, it wouldn't be feasible. It just costs too much for the amount of power increase that you're going to get. And in the end, it's, the project is successful for me for when I want to put a panel on it, because I plan to. But overall, unless you can, no, sorry, unless you can mass produce them, it's not really cost effective. And that's sometimes you got to look at the fact that if somebody hasn't already done it, there's probably a reason. But I was able to demonstrate it clearly for, for my perspective. Um, the schedule, I, my design took a little bit longer than hoped, but construction I was on schedule and <coughs> took a little bit longer than hoped. But I did finish everything by today, which was the biggest deadline. Um, so the project, it is a success in the sense that I was able to demonstrate, I was able to find out what I wanted to know. It, it does work to in, improve efficiency, but it is not cost effective at all. Um, yeah, so, any questions? <laughs>